it's great to uh, virtually uh, visit Stanford. Uh, as mentioned, I actually was a postdoc uh, at Stanford uh, working with Jeff here uh, on data visualization. So it's great to actually connect back. Um, so today I will be sharing some of my past and also ongoing research work in designing and building data, data visualization systems and tools. So my research group is called Human Data Interaction Group. Uh, we are primarily interested in designing and developing human-centered techniques and systems to support interactive data analysis and also data-driven communication. So uh, these are my uh, wonderful uh, PhD students, and uh, we're working together trying to actually uh, think about how we can actually best uh, enable users and uh, machines to work together. So when a user wants to gain some insights about a data set or trying to communicate some findings about a data set, they do that through an interactive system. And um, oftentimes user needs to convey their goals and their intents and preferences to the system and which is processed by the uh, system. And in response, the system will try to produce generate some visual representations of data, which needs to be interpreted and consumed by the user. So basically in this kind of a loop, we have um, um, basically this interaction between human and machine. And Lick Leiter, uh, in back in 1960, actually proposed his vision on human computer symbiosis, which basically is about a very tight coupling between the human and also the machine. Um, he anticipated that uh, in this collaboration model, uh, humans will be the uh, uh, ones who are setting the goals, formulating the hypothesis, determining the criteria, and then performing the evaluations. And the machine, on the other hand, will do the more kind of a mundane and potentially repetitive work. Um, and then together, if this symbiotic relationship actually works well, uh, the human and the machine can actually produce more effective results than either the man or the uh, machine alone can actually produce. So in the real world, of, uh, however, in order to enable this kind of a symbiotic relationship, we actually face two kinds of challenges. Uh, on one hand, oftentimes, uh, the visual representations produced by the systems can be potentially ineffective or can be very hard to interpret um, by the humans. And on the other hand, uh, uh, humans also sometimes have troubles or difficulties articulating their goals, intents, and preferences because there is a misalignment between users' mental models and the system's models. So in my talk today, I will talk about two threads of research work trying to address these two challenges. Uh, the first thread is really trying to understand how we can produce or generate effective and interpretable visual representations of data. And we will be looking at this problem in the context of visual analysis and summarization of event sequence data. And in the second part of my talk, I will be talking about how we can potentially align system model and human mental models uh, in the context of authoring and reusing data visualization designs. So let me start with the first thread first. Um, so um, in our daily life and work, actually we encounter lots of event sequence data. So when I was working at Adobe, um, the company uh, analysts were actually interested in understanding how customers come to Adobe's uh, website and then navigate on the website. So every click uh, the user makes on the website generates a timestamp and a page name. So this basically is are the different attributes of, of an event, right? So as the user navigates to different parts of the website, all their interactions generates a sequence of events. So this is one uh, example of event sequence data um, in um, commercial domains, and these are called click streams. Uh, event sequence data are also pervasive in many other domains. So for example, uh, when a patient comes to a hospital, hospital uh, they often have to go through some kind of uh, checkups. Um, so this, this, uh, this is a data set uh, from a pediatri pediatric trauma unit where the patient needs to go through the so-called ABCDE events checking, so airway, breathing, circulation, etc. So the, uh, um, the doctors actually are interested in trying to understand the potential hidden patterns inside these records. For example, is, this, is the procedure actually strictly fo followed? Um, are actually there are any kind of deviations from the expected procedures. 
So in general, we have clickstream data, patient records uh, as event sequence data, but also we have other kinds of uh, data sets like human movements, uh, development workflows, application log data, and also digital marketing touch points. And the tasks that try that you, that the analyst tries to actually um, perform on these data sets can also vary quite a bit. Sometimes people are interested in trying to identify the common patterns in the data set. So for example, what are the typical navigation paths on the website? In other cases, it's more about de de detecting anomalies. Uh, so for example, in the example of uh, uh, patient records, uh, the doctors want to know do patients actually go through essential checks in the right order. And in other cases, people are more interested in doing some clustering, trying to group similar events and sequences to identify uh, groups of behavior. And of course, uh, oftentimes in order to answer these questions, we need to uh, visualize the data and then explore the data. And there are uh, visualizations uh, available for us to actually apply to these kind of data sets. So here we're looking at two examples, the Sankey diagram on top and the icicle plot at the bottom. Uh, so commercial tools like uh, Google Analytics or Adobe Analytics actually make use of these visualizations to show uh, um, uh, event sequence data set. Uh, the problem is that um, these visualizations are not very scalable. So here we're applying the Sankey diagram to only a moderately sized data set of click streams consisting of only a dozen unique events and only six steps. And the Sankey diagram becomes really hard to understand. Similarly, if we're only looking at only 200 different sequences of patients' uh, records, um, the icicle plot at the bottom is really unintelligible. Um, so the problem is then how do we produce effective and e interpretable visual representations of data, uh, in this case, uh, event sequence data. So in order to do that, we need to perform potentially data summarization or data reduction so that we can actually reduce the number of visual items to be shown to the users. Uh, so we first stick into the data mining literature and we found a technique called sequential data uh, pattern mining. So uh, here's an example. We have five input sequences, um, and they're going from top to bottom. And what sequential pattern mining does is that it is tries to identify a common set of events across multiple sequences where the order of these events in the original sequences are preserved. So here, for example, we're looking at a pattern E1, E2, E3, E4, E9, and they appear in all of the five input sequences. And similarly, we can find other kinds of patterns, which may only uh, happen in a subset of this data. So here we have a shorter pattern, and we can continue to find more if we lower the kind of the percentage of the uh, sequence required. Um, so based on this uh, technique, we can actually design some uh, visualizations trying to help people to make sense of their data. So here is a representation of a pattern mined from the data set. This shows uh, people are actually going through the uh, consumer admin landing page, and then they're going to pay their bill later. We also show the amount of people going through each of these milestone events in the pattern. And then we show the uh, individual sequences matching this pattern uh, as an icicle plot. And we can highlight the milestone or key events uh, in the icicle plot as shown here. And we can also add some additional information to show the frequency, uh, frequency of these individual uh, sequences. And with this basic setup, we can enable people to interactively explore the data. So for example, when I click on the event, I can interactively align these different sequences by that event so that I can more clearly see what is happening before an event or in between a pair of events. So that's kind of like the first iteration of uh, the visualizations we came up with. And what we were doing basically is trying to follow Ben Schneiderman's information seeking mantra, right? Overview first, zoom and filter, and then detail on demand. So here we're using this particular visualization as the overview. The question is, is this an effective overview? So when we showed this to the, um, um, the users, they their first impression was that, okay, there are actually 10 different um, uh, sequ sequences or patterns uh, which are shown to me, which means that there are actually 10 different groups of behaviors. But this is a very wrong interpretation of the visualization. If we look at, for example, these three highlighted patterns here, we actually see that uh, these three patterns are actually telling 
uh, as about the same thing. Uh, it's about the uh, user's consumer's checkout loading page, right? So we have very similar events like checkout loaded, checkout uh, load, loading, and then confirming order, and then submitting order, and et cetera. So actually, there are lots of overlapping sequences between these three patterns. So this is actually potentially misleading. Um, so in order to address this problem, uh, we actually we were inspired by this idea uh, called a branching pattern. So this is a visualization appeared in the Visualization Arts program at VIS 2016, where people are trying to visualize how the different roles actually converge to Rome. Uh, so if we were actually very inspired by this visualization because we thought, well, if every user's or every customer's journey on a website can be actually thought of as kind of like a physical journey, then their navigation path may actually differ quite a bit, but there are some commonalities in terms of the milestone events they come through, right? So uh, can we actually design a data mining algorithm that tries to actually pull out these branching patterns uh, from a data set? And uh, based on this idea, we came up with uh, CoreFlow. And this is actually uh, the visualization produced by CoreFlow. Uh, it's basically uh, showing the same data set. Uh, we starting with uh, around 5,000 different uh, visits. Uh, we see that about 55.2% of these uh, customers, they go to the checkout loading page. And the y-axis encodes the average number of steps uh, going to that page. So it took people about every, uh, on average like 12 steps to go to the checkout loading page. And we see about 25, around 25% 25 of the customers, they go to the Adobe's plans page to manage their plans. And then for people who went to the checkout loading page, we can see the step-by-step -step, uh, process of how they actually go through the uh, order process, right? And, they, and then we also see the gray areas. These are the places where people are leaving or dropping out. Um, so uh, we can also see more coherent uh, things, behaviors going on in other parts of the website. So this visualization basically gives us a more complete understanding of what's going on in people's uh, navigation behave behavior without uh, actually any overlapping uh, patterns. Under the hood, CoreFlow uses a uh, uh, three-step uh, algorithm, a uh, recursive algorithm to produce this kind of visualizations. So we first try to rank the events divide the sequences and then trim the sequences. And we do this recursively until we reach the end of all the sequences. So here's a very brief illustration. So for example, here we have six input sequences and uh, we first try to rank uh, all the events in these sequences by some predefined metrics. So for example, here uh, C is ranked top because it appears in the most number of sequences with the lowest average index uh, in, in these sequences. So we add C to the branching pattern, and then we divide the sequences into two groups, those containing C and those not containing C. And then we trim uh, the sequences containing C so that we can basically focus on the subsequences after uh, the first uh, event C. Uh, so that's the first iteration. And then we basically do this recursively for all the groups that have been generated um, because of this process. Uh, doing rank, divide, and trim again. And, and basically, that's how this um, uh, branching pattern is being actually mined. So looking at these two different visual representations of the same data set, I think most of us will agree that uh, the core flow representation, the one on the right, is actually more effective than the one on the left, right? So reflecting on this uh, uh, process, actually, uh, we realized that in order to produce interpretable visualization and data reduction, often it makes sense to start with visualization design instead, with, uh, in instead of starting with the data mining algorithm. So that's the, actually the first lesson we learned from this uh, exercise. And over the years, uh, actually, uh, we see more and more visualization summarization techniques uh, that came out trying to uh, visualize event sequence data in many different domains. And these techniques are getting more and more sophisticated. Uh, so for example, here is a new approach trying to propose an information the theoretic uh, way to summarize event sequence data. So given the in uh, in uh, input sequences, uh, we try to first cluster them into distinct clusters. And then we try to uh, summarize each cluster using a sequential pattern. Um, so in this case here, the main problem is trying to decide how do we actually, how many clusters do we need? 
And in order to solve this problem, we can use an information theoretic approach where the description length of the data set can be defined as consisting of the overview, which are the sequential patterns, and then the encoding of the raw data based on the overview, which are the corrections of the patterns, which can lead us to the original input data. And then based on this formulation, uh, the problem becomes basically trying to achieve a balance or trade-off between the simplicity of the overview and its information loss, right? So we can actually mathematically formulate the description length of any potential uh, visual summarization generated using this approach. And then we can try to come up with optimization algorithms trying to generate the right number of clusters. So that's one approach. And another one is basically trying to leverage deep learning models like sequence to sequence models, right? So this is a more recent paper where the authors tries to use an encoder and uh, decoder structure, trying to basically uh, summarize the probabilities of events happening in each time slot in a sequence. And then we can basically visualize uh, this, uh, this um, uh, learned representations from the data to the users. Uh, so given all these different approaches, actually we see many, many potential algorithms and uh, tools uh, that are available for people to uh, visualize their event sequence data. Uh, unfortunately, uh, all these um, tools produce very different results. Uh, so here we're looking at three visualizations, visual summarizations of the same data set produced by different tools. And they differ in terms of the structure of the summary. Some are in the form of sequences, some are in the form of trees, and some are in the form of a directed acyclic graph. And then we also, these summaries also differed wildly in terms of content, right? Like what kind of events are you included? What are the relationships between the events and also the exact quantitative information? And the granularity of these summaries can also vary quite a bit, uh, which are manifested in terms of the number of clusters and also the number of branches. So we actually did a survey on the uh, around 15 uh, also papers that tries to propose different ways to visually summarize this uh, event sequence data. And we realized that actually most of the uh, technique implementations are not available. There is no way for us to actually try them. Uh, and all these um, techniques are actually evaluated through case studies. There are no standard evaluation benchmarks and metrics. And oftentimes there is also a lack of explanations for the performance of a technique. Uh, if it if uh, an, if uh, summarization actually works, we don't know why it works that way. And if it fails to produce a meaningful visualization, we don't know why that happens. So in order to address this problem, uh, Zina, my student Zina and I, we uh, conducted the first comparative evaluation of visual summarization techniques for event sequence data. So we we collected six different data sets in very different domains. And we identified uh, a user task for each of these data set. And then for each data set, we try to actually analyze the data set and come up with some ground truth, which are basically the main insights we discovered from the data set. Uh, and then we conducted a crowdsourcing study trying to let people decide how accurate or how, how interp in interpretable these uh, visual summaries are. So users are basically presented with uh, an insight, which is the fact, and then they're shown a visual summary, uh, visual summary one at a time. So they need to give a Likert scale rating on how well the visualization actually represents the given fact or the ground truth. They also need to enter a short explanation for their rating. So based on this study, we found that actually there is a trade-off between the summary quality and also the time taken for people to interpret the visual summaries. So here we have three lines. Each line is a, a task. And then we, we are evaluating three different techniques. And you can basically see there is a kind of like a inverse uh, kind of like, uh, there is actually a correlation between uh, the average Likert scale rating and the amount of time um, taken to, to actually uh, read those or interpret those summaries. We also find that the summary quality rating depends on two factors, content and interpretability. So content basically is about the match between the visualization pattern and the insights. In other words, whether important events and associated quantitative information are actually included in the visualization. And in terms of interpretability, it's really about the effort needed to extract the information from the visualization by the users. Uh, so how easy it is to actually read and also understand the visualization. And this is only the first study, and we're doing actually more additional follow-up work 
Um, but this basically led us to this um, a new area of work where we need where we realize we need to perform human-centered comparison to evaluate these techniques. And in order to do so, we really need to do lots of research on the evaluation methodology, the metrics we use, and also potentially developing benchmarks uh, in terms of both data sets and also metrics uh, for this kind of research. Right, so that's kind of the first thread of um, uh, my work, uh, trying to produce visual representations of event sequence data. Uh, and we did different works in terms of visualization designs, designing new data mining algorithms, and also coming up with evaluation strategies, trying to compare different techniques. So next I will uh, talk about the second thread of my work, focusing on the articulation problem. How do we enable people to articulate their intent effectively to the system? And we will be talking about this in the context of uh, visualization creation, all right? So there are actually many different tools and very powerful tools out there enabling people to create an expressive visualization. Uh, so you are probably familiar with D3 or Vega Light or Tableau and ggplot too, right? Uh, but still there are potential limitations uh, um, um, for, for, for each of these tools. So let's take a few uh, examples. Let's take a look at a few examples. So here we're looking at a, a stacked bar chart. Uh, this chart basically shows how often do politicians uh, tell truth or lies, right? So um, the color indicates different categories, like ranging from uh, uh, false to true uh, and different degrees of uh, amount of lies. And then each row basically is a politician. And uh, the width of these rectangles represent uh, the frequency um, of uh, basically uh, falling into each category. Um, this is a perfectly fine chart, but oftentimes people would like to see how uh, the truth and the, the lies actually diverge. So people often actually adopt a slightly variation of this design. This is called a diverging stack bar chart. So basically we try to align uh, these bars in the center so that it's more clear to see who lies more and who actually tell truth more. Um, so in order to go from the design to the left to the design on the right, actually most people's intuition would be just trying to align these different bars in the center by the gray area, right? Uh, so that's a very intu intuitive way to describe how you would actually uh, create some uh, the design on the right. But this is not how many of the uh, visualization toolkits uh, work. Um, so these toolkits often, so for example, this is the code you need to write to actually create a diverging stack bar chart in ggplot2. In order to do this, you have to actually go back to the source data and then change all the data related to the false category to negative values. And then you basically you need to regenerate the visualization again, which is counterintuitive to many people's mental models. So here's another uh, very simple chart. This is uh, a mosaic chart, or sometimes people call it a Merrimackle chart. Uh, so here we're looking at basically different uh, manufacturers uh, of computer devices and then different categories of computer devices, phone, laptop, desktop. And then the um, basically the proportion of uh, each device uh, by different manufacturer, right? So it's a very uh, straightforward visualization. Uh, when we actually ask people how they would describe or create this kind of visualization, I, I think many of the people thought describing this visualization as some kind of like a slicing and dicing a rectangle. So you start with a rectangle and then you slice and dice it in horizontally and vertically by manufacturer and then by uh, the, uh, the device type might be an easy way to create this visualization. However, this is not, for example, how Tableau works. Uh, so my Zina, when he worked, worked on the uh, uh, event sequence evaluation paper, she needed to create some something like this, and she couldn't figure out how to do that in Tableau. She had to search online and found this kind of 16-step tutorial on how to create a mosaic chart in Tableau, which is really tedious. Um, so in general, I think there is a misalignment between people's mental model and visualization models. And oftentimes it's really hard for people to articulate what they want uh, to a system. And so here and Bostock and here actually argued that uh, many of these powerful visualization systems can be intimidating to novices or they can also be inflexible. Uh, so the abstractions used may be actually foreign to the users. 
So as a result, designers may actually often resort to vector-based drawing programs to realize that their intent. So how do designers actually work in vector-based um, uh, drawing tools? So here's an example. Um, often these tools are offer direct manipulation and offer a what you see is what you get interface, right? So if you move a shape around, um, these dynamic guys appear trying to let you know if objects are aligned or how far they are from each other. Um, we also see tools like Figma. So here is a feature in Figma, which allows you to basically try to um, perform responsive design. So once you set up some constraints, um, and then you can basically dynamically resize an object and all the other objects will actually uh, respond accordingly. Um, so can we achieve something like this for data visualization creation? Can people create data visualization uh, using a similar interaction paradigm? Uh, so this has been a problem that people, people have been exploring for a while. Uh, so when I was at Stanford, actually, I attended a talk by Brett Victor, where he first proposed this idea of drawing dynamic visualizations. And this is one of his demos, right? You can basically draw uh, these bars and populate them with data, and then you can directly manipulate, the, uh, for example, the um, text labels, uh, map uh, data to the content of these labels, uh, changing the colors. Um, and you can also potentially dynamically change the scales of these um, um, bars. Um, so it's a very intuitive and also very uh, um, direct um, manipulation experience. Um, when I was working at Adobe, we also worked on something similar. It's called Project Lincoln. Again, we were trying to enable users to directly draw things in the canvas and ma manipulate it directly um, and also binding different visual properties of these shapes to data. So when we actually presented Lincoln at a conference, um, people were actually quite skeptical about it. Uh, so Nathan Yao, who runs the Flowing Data blog, uh, he after he watched the Lincoln, he wrote a blog post. Um, and he basically says that, well, with data visualization, oftentimes you should start with data. And then you work on the geometry and colors and aesthetics later on. So the data really informs the design. And he thinks Project Lincoln is trying to flip this workflow. And it doesn't seem to make much sense to him. Um, so he's basically saying, my brain was confused and my, my gut says no. Um, I can see why he was not very convinced because uh, the kind of the uh, mainstream approach to create visualization oftentimes is, is what we know as grammar of graphics, right? So um, in order to create a visualization, you start with data, and then you go through a number of different stages in a process, right? You define the variables, the algebra, the scales, uh, statistics, geometry, and so on. And in doing so, basically, you are building up a formal specification of what you want the visualization to be like. And then you can pass this formal specification to a renderer, which will compile the specification and produce the final visualization for you. So this is a very powerful idea, and uh, it has been implemented in many programming libraries and toolkits, and it has been demonstrated to be really expressive, uh, able to some support a wide range of visualization designs. It is unknown if this, the uh, ideas of direct manipulation can actually scale to many different visualization designs. So we were basically interested in understanding, can we develop a similar kind of visualization grammar but based on the uh, direct manipulation paradigm. Um, so our research question then basically is trying to uh, come up with a framework for manipulable semantic components, which are basically graphical objects and also associated relationships that can be visually represented and manipulated at design time. And we are interested in understanding what are the semantic components in data visualization design and what are the operations to manipulate these components with data. So in order to answer these questions, we conducted a two-year formative study with three different designers. Uh, we work with them um, one hour per week, and we ask them to use their favorite tools. It could be Adobe Illustrator, it could be Figma, to create uh, some visualizations we give to them. And based on their workflows, we came up with around 40 different storyboards and mockups, and we distilled this into a set of components and operations. Uh, so I won't go into the details of the uh, specific of this uh, framework. Basically, we have visual objects, which are mark, glue, glyph, uh, collection, and reference object, and we have parametric layout, 
uh, things basically trying to um, uh, position items using some kind of automated layout like grid layout stacking and so on. We have encodings and scales which are central to data visualization. We also have graphical constraints like alignment and also a fixation. And then we have a set of operations which, can, which we define to operate on these visual objects and also layouts. Um, so we implemented this framework uh, in a library called MASCOT, uh, standing for Manipulable Semantic Components. Uh, and we're able to demonstrate its expressive power uh, by actually producing a gallery of diverse visualization designs. Um, so this work basically lays the foundation for many applications for doing interactive visualization. Um, so one application is actually we can enable people to author visualizations from scratch uh, using a what you see is what you get approach. And so this is implemented in a system called Data Illustrator. Um, as the name suggests, basically it's trying to adopt the paradigm of interaction in Adobe Illustrator, but for data visualizations. So here is the interface for Data Illustrator. Uh, we have uh, a toolbar on the top. Uh, so you can see we have some of the regular drawing tools and also some of the operations in the mascot framework. And then we have the input data at the bottom. Uh, that's the CSV data you work with. And then in the center, we have the canvas. So that is where you draw shapes, you manipulate shapes, uh, and, and basically do all the editing you want. And on the right, we have a layers view, which basically shows the hierarchy of the organizations of these visual objects on the canvas. And we also have a property inspector panel, panel, which shows all the different visual properties for each of the uh, visual objects. And you can actually perform data binding in this panel as well. So let's take a look at how Data Illustrator works in action. Uh, so our goal is trying to create a um, very simple uh, pie chart design like this. So we have two different countries and two different years, and we want to visualize the house, household expenditure pattern. Uh, in these countries in different years. So at the bottom right, we have the input data we have. So we have four attributes, country, year, category, and also percentage. Um, in order to create something like this in the grammar of graphics, basically what we need to do as we saw earlier is trying to actually write a formal specification. And here's how we can create something in uh, similar in Data Illustrator. So we first try to uh, use the circle tool to draw a circle, and then we repeat it by the country variable. There are two different countries in this data set, UK and New Zealand, right? And then we can keep repeating this structure to by a different variable, year. So then we can basically get this simple grid layout. Uh, I can do some customizations of the axis to make the axis look nicer, right? And uh, I can dynamically change the gap between these different uh, visual objects uh, on the canvas. And then after that, we can select any of these circles. Uh, and then we can divide it by the household spending variable. Um, so that gives us basically all the pies we need, each pie for each uh, uh, expenditure category. And then we can bind uh, the angle of the pies and also the color of the pies to appropriate data attributes. And in a very few, in a very few clicks, we are already creating uh, uh, something similar to the end result we want. And then now we can further do some kind of a customization. So the default color palette doesn't seem really nice. So I can basically use this interactive legend to pick the color I want. And finally, I can do more touch-ups. So for example, the axis here doesn't really look really nice. So I can, again, try to customize it through these uh, property inspector panel and also try to change the label format. Uh, as well, right? So that's how you can create uh, um, visualization designs like this um, dynamically in Data Illustrator just in just a few minutes. Um, so reflecting upon this research work, uh, I think um, one of the lessons we learned is that in, we should really try to augment and respect users' current practices and tools. And in order to, 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 to do this, we need to come up with a set of primitive abstractions which are composable and also interpretable. Um, so after Data Illustrator, we continued this uh, research and then we were looking at more complex data visualizations. So for example, here we're looking at a fairly complex layout used in the visualization. So this is a tree map bar chart. Uh, it's showing 
the import and export revenues um, by different countries. Uh, so we have all these different bars, groups of bars uh, corresponding to imports and exports, and they are arranged by different years. And then each rectangle here represents a country color-coded by their continent. Um, so when we showed this to the um, uh, potential users of Data Illustrator, they, were, they had no idea what components or operations they should actually use to create something like this. And this problem is not unique to Data Illustrator, right? For any kind of a visualization library or tool, uh, it's very hard to actually translate the design you want into a set of operations or primitives afforded by that tool. So in fact, based on our interview study with uh, visualization designers, we found that actually they rely extensively on examples for both design ideation, also implementation. But however, they're facing challenges in using examples. Oftentimes they don't really know how to modify the example to suit their own data set and needs. And oftentimes they face difficulties in trying to oper operationalize the desired changes using specific tools. So to address this problem, we looked into previous literature and we were actually inspired by this idea of reusing an existing chart. Uh, so there has been some work that tries to actually convert, for example, the three charts into reusable style templates. And also uh, researchers from Microsoft Research also looked at how we can actually reuse infographics charts. However, these works uh, have their own limitations because they mostly focus on style, not layout and they only support basic chart types. Uh, furthermore, some tools also assumes the examples are created by a specific tool, uh, which is not very generalizable. So we are interested in trying to understand how we can support uh, tool agnostic reuse of complex layout in SVG charts. So SVG is a universal vector graphics format that many tools are actually using. Um, so uh, what if we can actually just uh, get an SVG chart uh, without using its source code and without getting its underlying data, can we actually try to reuse the design and apply it to our own data set? So at this, this year actually, um, the conference is next week, uh, we're going to present uh, our work on this problem. It's called Mystique, Deconstructing SVG Charts for Layout Reuse. So here we are, we are adopting a human machine collaboration approach uh, trying to solve this problem. Uh, so first, we try to pre-process an SVG example by detecting the legend and also the axis in a chart. And since this uh, is not always 100% uh, accurate, we let users verify the axis and legend extraction results um, and correct any mistakes if they have to. And after that, we try to automatically deconstruct the main chart content into a set of layout components based on mascot, uh, the manipulable semantic component frameworks. Uh, and then users, so here basically we came up with the bottom up hierarchical clustering algorithm, trying to group individual visual marks into meaningful groups and also layouts. And then finally users can then try to import their own data and specify the mappings between uh, these components and also their own data. So here, here is a demo of how Mystique works. So we have imported this uh, tree map bar chart and uh, uh, first Mystique tries to automatically extract the X axis and the Y axis and the legend. And you can see there are some mis mistakes, right? So Mystique, Mystique misses the year labels, uh, which is the second level of X axis. And also it got the type of the Y axis wrong. It should be numbers instead of categories. So we offer this interface for users to actually correct all these different mistake, mistakes. You can just drag and drop these labels and then change the uh, uh, data variable type. And then here we are going into the main interface. We're looking at the main chart content. And then here Mystique actually tries to analyze and decompose the components of the charts and then guide the user throughout a, a like a, a very structured process. So here first Mystique tries to highlight the first group of uh, rectangles and ask the user what this highlighted group of rectangles should represent in their new data set. So the user have a new data set, which is about uh, uh, superstore uh, sales. So we have orders, different order IDs, category of products, subcategory, region and sales speaker. So the user basically can just choose from a drop-down menu uh, saying this group should be mapped to furniture. 
And then um, Mystique basically goes to the next step and uh, highlighting different parts of the visualization and asking users what uh, data variable in a new data set should be mapped to that particular component. So it goes through all these different groupings and then also down to the level of individual marks. And then it goes to the, uh, and then it proceeds to the encodings, right? So it asks the user what the height of each group should, should represent and what the color should represent. And users can just simply choose from a drop down menu. And then all the visualizations will update dynamically in real time. Um, so with this very simple wizard kind of interface, users can reuse an existing very complex data visualization on their own data set. Right. So uh, in doing so, basically what Mystique does is that it tries to actually try transform the visualization creation and authoring task and also the skill requirement. When users are using Mystique, they no longer need to understand all the primitives or the components in a very complex visualization framework. Instead, all they need to do is just trying to specify which part of the visualization should be mapped to which part of the uh, data, data set. So uh, I'd like to conclude my talk with some quotes from uh, Edward, Edwin Hutchins' uh, book, Cognition in the Wild, where he's basically studying and talking about the nature of cognitive tools. Data visualization, for sure, is a category of cognitive tools. And Hutchins basically argues that tools permit us to transform difficult tasks into ones that can be done by simple pattern matching, by the manipulation of simple systems, or by mental simulation of simple systems. And tools provide constraints on the organization of action. By constraining the representational states that can be produced to ones that are syntactically correct, it provides the user with guidance as resources used in the regulation of behavior. So in applying this uh, argument in the context of MISTIC, basically we're trying to transform the this difficult task of visualization authoring into simple actions of choosing things from a drop-down menu, right? And also we're providing constraints by actually providing this guided wizard interface uh, so that users have less chance to make mistakes, mis mistakes and they actually have, they're having structured guidance throughout the process. So with that, I'd like to uh, conclude my talk and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Leo. Um, we have about 15 minutes for questions. Um, if you have a question, you can either type it on chat or feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Okay, while we're waiting, why don't I maybe start with a question? So, you know, this, this diagram that you're showing here um, for interacting with the visual system, like, of course, like, you know, you need to have like goals and intentions and like ways to input those intentions. And then you need to be able to sort of perceive like, you know, what the system produced and the generated output. And like, this is sort of modeled after like the, the Hutchins, Jim Holland, Don Norman's like alpha of execution evaluation kind of thing. Yes. A lot of your talk sort of touches on like either simplifying the production of visualizations or like abstracting out some of the algorithms and techniques like what you showed in the, the click sequence thing where mm -hmm. you know different techniques and different algorithms produce very different kinds of visualizations mm -hmm. so either for like a designer or the end user of these kinds of interactive visualization system like how important is it for them to understand the underlying algorithm or technique and like you know how is the visualization community thinking about like making this happen so that they can have more accurate mental models right i think uh i talked about two actually very different uh, use cases and potentially very, two very different kind of user groups. Mm -hmm. So the, the work on event sequence are mostly targeted towards uh, data analysts mm -hmm. who need to do kind of a more in-depth uh, data uh, exploration work. Yeah. Uh, there, I think it is important for them to be able to interpret what the machine produces to them. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, oftentimes showing an overview is often not sufficient. Uh, they, that's why I think in our, as you can see in our first design iteration, we actually used uh, kind of like a overview first, and then you can actually mm. do details on demand and drill down into the individual data cases. Yeah. I think that's very important um, in order to for you, for you to really understand 
mm. how the what, what these summaries are capturing and mm. how these summaries are related to the uh, raw sequences, for okay. example. Okay. And uh, in the second case, it's more about basically creating visualizations or authoring uh, visualizations. Mm. And I think there, um, because the end result or the end goal is just to create something that a user potentially wants, mm. and they sort of know what they want, at least that's in the prob proper definition, right? So we assume they have some designs in mind or they have some examples they want to uh, reuse. Mm. Uh, so in those cases, I think it's less important for them to understand the inner working mechanisms of the systems. Okay. Uh, as long as they can be sure the system is on the right track to produce what they want, probably that's uh, good enough. Okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah, while we wait, maybe I'm going to um, ask you about, like, you know, how are you thinking about all this work sort of shifting or, like, being augmented with generative AI and large language models? Like, obviously, like, recently, even in, like, the data visualization community, we are seeing more and more of... Um, the use of large language models that either like abstract out the kind of direct manipulation interfaces that you're talking about, both for mm -hmm. analytics as well as like, you know, generating these uh, kinds of visualizations. Um, here is to yeah. hear your thoughts about like, where do you think it can help and like, what are some of the limitations you're seeing? Yeah, definitely. That's a very interesting question. And I think that's on everybody's mind. Uh, so I think uh, I'm thinking of two potential applications, right? One is the, in the generation or creation of visualizations, and the other one is in, the, in terms of understanding uh, visualizations. So in terms of visualization generation, I think uh, large language models basically still tries to actually produce code. Uh, for you, right? So you describe what you want, or potentially what data you have, and it tries to uh, generate some uh, example code um, for you. And then you have to uh, basically run the code and then produce the final visualization. Hmm. Um, I think there are also, uh, LLMs can also potentially give you design ideas as well. So you can actually ask questions such as, okay, I have this data set, how do I visualize it? And I believe it will produce some reasonably kind of uh, accurate recommendations on the chart types you can actually use. Mm. So I think uh, in this sense, it's actually very helpful for to people who don't have too much visualization knowledge or design expertise. Uh, just I think it can be a good brainstorming tool for them to actually uh, identify potential visualization ideas. Um, I think in many cases, probably the code produced by uh, LIMs are is going to be uh, okay, and you can just use it, and it works out of the box. But once something goes wrong, I think uh, it still requires the users to have the expertise to understand the uh, kind of the abstractions used in whatever library um, the code is written in, mm -hmm. and also requires the it requires users to be able to actually change the code if whenever it's, whenever necessary. So I think there's still room to incorporate the direct manipulation uh, in this process, okay. um, even natural language interfaces as well. So instead of producing code and asking people to change the code, what if people can just simply uh, re like refine their uh, intent or try to point out mistakes in the code, and then the system can actually try to regenerate the visualization. I think there are potential research opportunities there. Okay. Um, and then in terms of chart understanding, actually, I just tried uh, GPT-4V a few days ago, and I was mm. really impressed. Okay. I just gave it a, like a random chart, like parallel coordinates or whatever, and, and then ask it to describe the image. It does a really good job of doing that. Uh, uh, based on my experience, it seems to be doing less well in actually ac accurately mm. estimating the like the visual properties, like the positional size, which mm. I think is less accurate. But in trying to understand the encoding, like uh, the design of the chart, I think he's doing a pretty good job. Even with your tree map bar chart? Oh, I haven't tried that. That's a good question. Yeah, I, I didn't try that one. I, okay. I should. Okay, okay. Um, thank you. Um, if there are other questions, um, feel free to just unmute and ask or um, type the question on chat.
Okay, well, uh, if there are no other questions, let's uh, thank Leo once again uh, for the wonderful talk, and uh, I will meet with you in a couple of hours, Leo. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.